Victor Frankenstein has been confined to his sickbed for many months. He's been suffering from an acute nervous disorder ever since he brought a monster to life and then abandoned it. Of all the things he could have done with this scientific knowledge, Victor chose to reanimate a hideous creature assembled from dead body parts. He now has no idea where the thing has gone. It's probably already crawled into a cave and died, right? Victor's best friend, Henry Clerval, has nursed Victor through the worst of his illness, although Clerval still has no idea what Victor did to put himself in this state. But now that Victor's perking up a bit, Clerval hands him a letter from Elizabeth Lavenza, Victor's adopted sister. The letter reveals how worried she and Victor's father, Alphonse, have been. Clerval had informed them that Victor was very ill, but kept them in the dark about the full extent of it. Apart from begging Victor to write back, Elizabeth fills Victor in on what's been happening at home. His father's health is good. His younger brother, Ernest, wants to join the military. Little William is thriving. And Justine Moritz, a beautiful servant girl, has returned to help the family. All this good news lifts Victor's spirits, and he writes back immediately. A few weeks later, Victor is well enough to show Clerval around the University of Ingolstadt. He introduces Clerval to a few of the professors, but this ends up triggering Victor's anxiety. Since the monster incident, Victor has developed a strong aversion to science. He can't even bear the sight of chemical instruments. So when he introduces Clerval to professors Waldman and Kremper, their praise for Victor's achievements makes him squirm. Clerval picks up on this and changes the subject, literally. He wants to study languages not science, and signs up for courses on Arabic, Persian and Sanskrit. Nice choice, Clerval. In fact, Victor joins him to take his mind off things and find solace in the warmth and melody of the Eastern languages. Is this the end of Victor's career in science? It certainly seems that way. The following year, Victor and Clerval spend a glorious two weeks hiking in the areas around Ingolstadt. The fresh spring air revives Victor, and Clerval is fantastic company. It's as if the whole monster thing never even happened. On his return to Ingolstadt, Victor receives a letter from his father. He'd been expecting to hear from his father to know when he can return home to Geneva. But Victor is called home under very different circumstances. Little William has been murdered. He'd gone missing on a family walk and was found early the next morning, lying in the grass with finger marks on his neck. Victor wastes no time. He hires a carriage and heads straight for Geneva. As Victor draws closer to home, the majestic scenery he once loved becomes dark and ominous. He feels destined to become the most miserable human being to ever walk the earth. But he doesn't even know the half of what's to come. He stays the night in a village just outside Geneva and hires a boat to cross the lake. He wants to see the spot where William was murdered. By the time he reaches the opposite shore, a violent storm has descended. Victor treks on through the storm, excited by the brilliant flashes of lightning. Suddenly, a gigantic figure emerges from behind a clump of trees. Just what you want to see when walking alone in the hills at night. The next flash of lightning reveals its identity. It's the monster. He's back. Victor stares at the hideous creature for a moment before realising that he must be William's murderer. The terrible thought hits Victor like a punch in the guts, and he leans against a tree for support. The monster passes him quickly and disappears into the wild night. Victor feels the urge to pursue the demon, but he's no match for its supernatural speed and strength. That thing moves like the wind. Victor spends the rest of the night out in the open, 
brooding. He barely registers the weather as he stews over his new reality. The monster he created is on the loose, wreaking havoc among mankind. You'd think Victor might tell someone the truth at this point, but no, he doesn't think anyone will believe him. And even if they did, how could they possibly catch the stealthy monster? So he remains silent. Do you think this is wise? Finally, Victor returns home, six years after leaving for Ingolstadt. His brother Ernest tells him more shocking news. The murderer has been caught. Wait, what? How did they do that? It turns out that the family's faithful servant, Justine Moritz, has been accused of killing William. And her trial begins today. That poor girl. It turns out that a valuable picture was found in Justine's pocket. The very picture that William was wearing the night he was murdered. That, and Justine's confused behaviour when questioned, were enough to condemn her. Victor protests that Justine is innocent and he knows who the murderer is. But he still has no intention of spilling the details of his horrible creation. He doesn't want people to think he's crazy. Instead, he relies on Justine's obvious innocence and the lack of hard evidence. Elizabeth seems to be the one who's most affected by Justine's arrest. Victor assures her that Justine will be acquitted. But the court is much less forgiving. The descriptions of Justine's movements and behaviour on the night in question make her look guilty. And when the valuable miniature is shown as proof of motive, the courtroom is horrified. Justine is unable to explain how the picture had ended up in her pocket. All she asks is for people to come forward and testify to her impeccable character. At this point, Elizabeth steps forward and confidently addresses the court. Her praise for Justine is heartfelt and compelling. But it's no use. The judges are convinced of Justine's guilt. Victor sits in silent agony during the whole trial. Are his actions about to lead to the death of a second person? Instead of seizing the opportunity to say something in Justine's defence, Victor rushes out of the courtroom in a dramatic show of self-pity. The next morning, Victor attends the court to find out what he already knows. Justine is condemned to death. He also discovers that Justine has just confessed to the murder. Hang on, what's that all about? When Victor and Elizabeth return to visit Justine, she explains that her confession was a lie. Her confessor threatened and bullied her into believing that she really was a monster. In a moment of weakness, she confessed to William's murder and now she can't take it back. Even as Elizabeth and Justine weep together, Victor sits alone and silent in a corner. Instead of comforting poor Justine or saying something that might save her life, he just grinds his teeth and wallows in his own misery. The following day, Justine is hanged for William's murder, an appalling death for such a sweet young woman. Two innocent people are now dead, and Victor's family are inconsolable. Victor knows it's all his fault. Will he do something to prevent further carnage? We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.